right, well, uh, it's just a few of us, but uh, I'm hoping to have a good discussion about uh, MongoDB and uh, a potential uh, open standard coming out of it. So welcome everyone, my name is Peter Farkas and I am the CEO and co-founder of FerretDB. And today we are going to talk about, not really about FerretDB, but about MongoDB and uh, its current status as a database software and more importantly as a proprietary uh, database software. So. Um, who would be among you who are actively using MongoDB? Okay, one, two-ish, okay. Uh, and uh, what about Postgres or relational databases? Yeah, that's a lot more. So let's see uh, if you will have questions after the presentation. I promise that uh, it's going to uh, reverse your time. Uh, the agenda for today is that we are going to uh, talk about, um, first of all, my background, a short intro, then the history of SQL as an open standard, and why that is important is uh, going to be explained later. And then uh, we are going to talk about uh, MongoDB, its current uh, license, and whether it is ripe to become an open standard. And then a short intro to FerretDB, its architecture, supported backends, and then um, uh, if we have time, a short uh, demo. So about me, my name is Peter Farkas, as I mentioned. Um, I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of FerretDB, and um, I have a background in open source, in open source databases. More importantly, uh, I've worked at uh, Cloudera and Percona before, and since 2021, um, uh, we founded FerretDB with my co-founders, and since then, I'm working on this uh, project. Uh, so FerretDB is an alternative to MongoDB based on Postgres, and we often get the question, who in their right mind would do this and why? So why would we even consider implementing an open source NoSQL database on top of a relational database? And uh, let me explain. So MongoDB, uh, as you can see, is uh, one of the um, most popular uh, NoSQL databases according to uh, the Stack Exchange survey of 2022 among developers. As you can see, MySQL is still the uh, most popular database, but it's a relational database. And there goes Postgres after it, SQLite, and the first NoSQL database on the list is MongoDB. So MongoDB is pretty much the de facto standard when it comes to NoSQL database used by uh, developers and um, and uh, well, and end users. Um, and this is a very shocking uh, thing to see because if you think about it, MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite, the first uh, three databases on the list, are open source, which means that if you choose either uh, of these databases, you are not logged into a particular vendor. But if you uh, look at MongoDB, you may think that that is also an open source database because it was until 2018, but it is no longer open source. Let me explain what happened to MongoDB since 2018. So in 2018, MongoDB adopted the, uh, their own license called the uh, server-side public license which is a very interesting license due to its history. So MongoDB Inc. Uh, intended this to be an open source license, a new open source license which opens the door uh, for uh, open source monetization. Uh, SSPL is engineered to keep providers such as uh, Civo or AWS to provide MongoDB as a service. Uh, the, the license says that if MongoDB is provided as part of a cloud service or a cloud service, then the provider either needs to pay a license fee or they need to open source their entire um, 
stack making the service uh, available. And we may think that this is bad for providers, but not necessarily bad for users. But that's not really the case, because at the end of the day, uh, if MongoDB is the sole actor who can um, name the price of the service, either through uh, pricing their services to their end users or pricing their license to uh, providers, this is going to be paid by uh, the users and those using MongoDB at the end of the day. Uh, that had an effect after SSP got adopted that um, more and more providers refused to pay the license fee or did not even get a seat at the table next to the big uh, database of the service providers. And the effect of this is that MongoDB is not available as a service at um, most providers, at least not, at least not a version since 2018. Let's take a look at uh, CIVO, uh, because uh, at this event, I think everyone is familiar with the CIVO marketplace. So these are all the databases available on the CIVO marketplace. As you can see, there are um, uh, relational databases, a wide variety of them, like MariaDB, Percona MySQL, or Postgres. But if you take a look at NoSQL databases, uh, they either offer MongoDB 4.2, uh, which is the last uh, version uh, released before the SSPL license. And of course, they offer FerretDB, which is an alternative to, uh, to, to, to MongoDB. So as you can see, um, for providers, there's not a lot of choice on, uh, on the uh, NoSQL database as a, a, a service uh, a arena. Um, and you know, if you think about it, offering MongoDB uh, version released in 2018, I mean, it's been five years. So it's really uh, approaching or even surpassed the end of life. And so what this means for end users is that, well, now I'm uh, you know, a little bit biased here, maybe, but I actually believe in this. If there's no FerretDB, then your only choice is really MongoDB and the old, ver old version and every uh, problem which, which comes with it. So this is why we uh, started um, developing FerretDB. You could ask, why wouldn't users just move from uh, MongoDB to a database like Postgres? It's because Postgres is not compatible with the uh, existing MongoDB um, MongoDB uh, uh, consumers like frameworks, uh, clients, tools, and everything else which exists in the MongoDB ecosystem. With Postgres, you can't use the MongoDB query language. You can't really use any, anything which is uh, already familiar to you. So um, before we go into FerretDB and how we are solving this problem with uh, FerretDB and Postgres, let's uh, look at the short story of SQL, which may sound as a weird um, uh, 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 way of uh, introducing the, the, the problem here, but um, trust me that uh, this is going to be uh, interesting and relevant. So the short story of SQL is that uh, uh, at IBM's research lab in Palo Alto, um, uh, uh, a man called uh, Edgar uh, Todd, um, uh, called, uh, Edgar Codd, uh, developed the concept of the first relational database. And uh, what you need to know about this, this happened in 1970. So this was a very, very early concept um, of a relational database, uh, exclusively uh, destined to be offered by, by IBM. So he came up with the concept of uh, relational, uh, the relational database, and also he came up with a query language for it. And the query language for um, 
Mr. Codd's uh, relational database was uh, not uh, something an end user would be able to digest. Uh, you pretty much had to be a mathematician slash a software developer in order to uh, actually be able to query uh, the database. So two other gentlemen, Don Chamberlain and Ray Boyce, uh, came to the rescue. They were the ones who came up with the first iteration of SQL, the query language, which was intended to make the relational database uh, usable for those without um, uh, uh, developer uh, background. This happened around 1970 uh, to 1973. Uh, one sad uh, uh, detail about this is that uh, the, um, uh, the out of the two researchers, Ray Boyce uh, actually died uh, one year after they came out with the first um, first. Uh, uh, publication on SQL, so uh, Ray Boyce never learned the tremendous impact what he had on uh, the world of databases and information technology. Don Chamberlain, however, is uh, still alive, is included in the Computer History Museum's um, Hall of Fame uh, in, in California. So these two gentlemen really came up with something which since then everybody uses. But how come everybody can use SQL across a number of different products? Well, in the late 70s, IBM started selling relational uh, databases uh, through uh, their, well, uh, computer appliances. So in order to, for you to be able to use a relational database, you had to buy this washing machine sized, or well, much larger IBM machine. And uh, if you liked SQL, you pretty much had to use an IBM machine and the uh, software uh, running uh, on it. Since relational databases started uh, becoming popular among IBM users, other vendors started implementing SQL, and they also started coming out with their own implementations of relational databases. There was a company called Relational Software Systems Incorporated, which got renamed to the much more familiar uh, Oracle. Uh, later on, and there was, of course, Informix and Sybase and IBM DB2. They all implemented SQL and they all implemented uh, uh, the concept of a relational database, but all of them worked a bit differently. So it's not like you could just move your workloads or your knowledge of using SQL across all of these different alternatives. All of them were a much different uh, dialect of SQL, and while the concept was similar, how it worked and how you interacted with them as a user uh, uh, was very, very different. So you still got logged into uh, one of these if you started using them. And then in 1986, 1987, SQL became so popular that it actually became uh, an industry standard, an open standard, which means that vendors came together and they decided how SQL should behave, how SQL should be used, uh, what SQL should be capable of. And this open standard could be implemented uh, by any, um, any vendor uh, wanting to, to, to incorporate SQL in, in their product. And this is how um, uh, open source uh, uh, implementations of SQL appeared. So this is how we can have MySQL, SQLite, or Postgres, where if you follow the open standard, or at least the majority of the open standard described um, in in the RFC document, then you are going to um, you are going to get products which would behave uh, um, similarly. Uh, and uh, would uh, interact with um, with the user in a in a similar way. So this is how um, in the in the world of relational databases, vendor lock-in pretty much ceased to exist. Well, as long as you are not using a product which extends uh, the capabilities of SQL. So. 
Ever since then, hundreds of derivatives appeared of uh, SQL and uh, these products, and uh, this, is, uh, this is how we, we know and understand and appreciate SQL as a, as a query language. So we might think that this is the end of the story, but uh, not really. So history repeats itself, and I guess now you're starting to realize where I'm trying to get uh, with all of this. So in, uh, in the late 2000s, MongoDB uh, appeared on the market as some revolutionary way of, uh, of storing and, uh, and fetching data. They wanted to come up with a database which, guess what, needs to be much more easier to use than relational databases. So they wanted to simplify, and they did simplify the way how developers and users can interact with the database. No schema needed. Uh, it's a very easy um, um, query language. It scales automatically, so you don't have to worry uh, about uh, anything pretty much if you use MongoDB. Of course, it had to mature. Uh, there were problems uh, in the beginning, but um, nowadays MongoDB is an accepted uh, and loved way of uh, storing uh, data and, 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 well, as a database in general. It was also open source, so the big difference between IBM's DB2 is that initially there was no vendor lock-in involved with MongoDB. However, in 2018, they decided that they are very much afraid of uh, the likes of AWS, who would just take the MongoDB uh, code or, or the product itself and just monetize it without them. So they went proprietary in 2018, uh, adopting the SSPR license, essentially uh, destroying competition uh, who were eyeing uh, uh, MongoDB as a solution to their uh, problems or, 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 or their offerings as a database as a service. They also attempted to redefine uh, the meaning of open source. So MongoDB wanted to introduce SSPL as the newest and best open source license. They actually failed uh, to do so. So this might be a familiar slide where uh, uh, I um, where we discussed uh, what happened with SQL initially and the alternatives which appeared um, uh, when, uh, when IBM, uh, or shortly after IBM came up with the concept of, of SQL. So the same thing happened with uh, the MongoDB query language. After 2018, many alternatives, well not many, but a couple of alternatives appeared where some vendors like Oracle, Microsoft, AWS, or even Huawei uh, implemented their own solutions to this problem where they can no longer use MongoDB because it's not open source. And their intentions were that they wanted to continue to offer uh, 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 an easy to use uh, document database to, to their customers. However, the exact same thing happened as when vendors or multiple vendors try to imitate uh, SQL. These are all implementations of the same thing. They, are all, they all intend to do or achieve something similar, but they are incompatible with each other. So you can't just move your workloads across these. You can't just move your MongoDB workloads from uh, MongoDB Atlas to, to, to Azure uh, Cosmos DB because you're going to run into compatibility problems. So once you choose one of these, you're stuck with that. And I think we all understand how bad that is in the world of databases. So all of these alternatives are great. Uh, they are all easy to use if you're looking at one of them. But since they are vastly different when it comes to their feature set, uh, and since they are all proprietary, there's not a lot of hope that uh, we are going to see the same ease of use and uh, trust as we have towards SQL as a query language. 
also for a MongoDB alternative, MongoDB actually sets the pace. So what if MongoDB introduces some shiny new feature, then all of the alternatives should eventually incorporate that as well, and that creates a lot of uh, uh, problems uh, with, with, uh, with maintaining an alternative. So we think that we need a sa the same or similar open standard for MQL as we have for SQL. The open standard should standardize the core features of a document database. It should incorporate a familiar query language, like MongoDB's query language, uh, which would uh, ensure that uh, alternatives are compatible with each other and that migration would be possible. So, this is the thought process we followed when we came up with uh, the I idea of creating an open source alternative to, to, to MongoDB, because since 2018, um, no one really considered doing that. Uh, we did not understand why. All of the co-founders had a pretty extensive background in open source and databases, and we were waiting for something to happen, but nothing really happened uh, in, in, in reality, except the proprietary uh, alternatives. So we founded FerretDB in 2021, middle of 2021. Uh, we have uh, Alexei Palaschenko and uh, Peter Zaitsev among our, our co-founders uh, who uh, worked at uh, Percona before. And uh, also, I'm also an uh, ex-Perconian. This is where the our care for databases are coming from. We also have Marcin Gwuzc uh, in the audience, who is our director of uh, strategic alliances. So we came together to uh, solve this problem. Uh, we listened to clients. They were all complaining about how SSPL makes it very hard for them to, to adopt or continue using MongoDB uh, as it is not just service providers, but also those who want to run MongoDB in the cloud, they may be in violation of the SSPL, SSPL uh, license. So what is FerretDB? FerretDB is a MongoDB compatibility layer, which means that it's not a separate database on its own. It uses Postgres, SQLite, or even uh, SAP HANA uh, as a storage layer. Uh, we are set out to become the de facto open source alternative or the open source NoSQL uh, database. Um, and we uh, release FerretDB under Apache 2.0. So with FerretDB, um, you're really uh, looking at a true open source uh, database. So what does MongoDB compatibility mean? Uh, MongoDB compatibility, compatibility mean that you don't really have to relearn uh, anything. Uh, you can use the same query language. Your clients can use the same query language. And that means that all of the tools, frameworks, and everything else, even documentation which exists for MongoDB, can be used with, uh, with FerretDB. And from the application side, um, it's not even uh, visible that it is not connecting to MongoDB, but uh, to, to FerretDB instead. Just a quick look at the, at the uh, concept here. So with, uh, with MongoDB, you have the MongoDB drivers connecting to the MongoDB API, which is already uh, SSPL licensed, and that interacts with the MongoDB engine. The drivers themselves are Apache 2.0. That can't really be changed because it's distributed with a lot of MongoDB client software. So that means that the MongoDB drivers are, we think, going to stay Apache 2.0. And how we are um, solving the problem of getting rid of the SSPL part of uh, this equation is that uh, FerretDB uh, actually interacts with the MongoDB, MongoDB drivers, so you just specify a, a FerretDB URL in your MongoDB driver configuration or application configuration, and FerretDB connects to a Postgres or SQLite or even SAP HANA uh, uh, instance, and this is how the whole stack is going to stay under an open source license. Why Postgres? 
uh, simply because it's the strongest of all relational databases for now when it comes to its community. So we were looking for a storage layer with good adoption, uh, high level of trust uh, towards it, and also it has existing JSON compatibility, which we could build on. Um, <clears throat> one interesting thing about uh, FaradDB is that since we are compatible with Postgres as the storage layer, if you're running, um, a, if you already utilize a Postgres as a service uh, solution, then you can just put FaradDB on top of it and we are going to be able to provide you a MongoDB alternative on your existing Postgres uh, database. So there's no need for um, rethinking uh, your whole stack because if you already have Postgres, there is a very high chance, 99% chance that uh, it will be uh, uh, able to function as the storage layer for FaradDB. And not just Postgres. So as I mentioned before, if you don't want to run a database next to FaradDB because your workload is on the smaller side, SQLite comes to the rescue. So we are also uh, compatible with SQLite as a storage layer that can run embedded with FaradDB. And, um, and uh, that simplifies a, a lot of things if, if your workload uh, allows that. Also, SAP started, or well, they've been working on creating compatibility in FaradDB with SAP HANA, which shows that uh, it is possible to create compatibility with any relational database, pretty much. And we do uh, support anyone's um, uh, efforts in, in doing so. Uh, we have uh, we always have questions about you know what about performance so we are basically turning a relational database into a uh, NoSQL database what is going to happen uh, with performance in this case so right now FaradDB is not as performant as MongoDB Atlas for example uh, based on our benchmarks in most use cases we are um, Half as a performant, we are actually head to head with Amazon's Document DB, which is trying to achieve uh, the same um, uh, uh, as 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 we do to create a MongoDB alternative. However, going back to the previous slide, we think and uh, we are working with the Postgres community uh, to increase this performance and uh, we think that there should be no obstacle when it comes to increasing performance of FaradDB to the point where it will be head-to-head -head, uh, with, uh, with any native uh, MongoDB uh, installation. The current progress, uh, very quickly, so we just released FaradDB 1.9.0, which is um, production ready. We have uh, users uh, using FaradDB replacing their uh, MongoDB uh, installations or their uh, um, embedded databases with FaradDB. Uh, we have uh, a couple of interesting use cases like network appliances still using MongoDB running embedded uh, inside them, uh, network firewalls. However, uh, JS frameworks uh, um, can also just start uh, using FaradDB without, um, without any without any uh, hassle. So let's say you have a Meteor.js or a Next.js application connecting to MongoDB using MongoDB. You can just replace the uh, URL in your uh, config file from a MongoDB instance to a FaradDB instance, and it is going to, um, it is going to uh, work. Uh, we are also available on the Civo and uh, uh, on the Civo marketplace and uh, Scaleway, the French uh, database as a service uh, provider as a service, and more providers are adopting uh, FaradDB as we speak, and we are working with them to make that happen as soon as possible. So my conclusion here is that um, first of all, 
uh, we don't truly really believe that uh, relational databases and document databases have an ongoing war between them. For many years, this was the narrative. We think uh, that instead of um, losing uh, market share, they are going to converge. So MongoDB started supporting some SQL uh, lately. Postgres started supporting some document uh, database uh, functionality like JSON. Uh, and uh, we think that there is an um, um, unavoidable, unavoidable uh, um, uh, trend where both of these uh, database uh, types uh, will be uh, um, will be approaching uh, or meeting uh, uh, similar uh, functionality. Um, but neither is going to win uh, this match. And with FaradDB, we are getting uh, relational databases and document databases closer to each other by um, offering the uh, document database experience on a relational database. So uh, imagine you're just running Postgres as you, as you do. You have some MongoDB workloads, and you can connect to the same database uh, with both MongoDB or NoSQL clients and your usual uh, SQL-based uh, clients as well. Uh, we uh, lead the way in uh, the process of turning MongoDB into um, an open standard. So we are talking to vendors across the NoSQL ecosystem, uh, creators of tools or MongoDB alternatives, and we are working on the RFC to define how an OSQL database or MQL should uh, behave the same way as uh, we have a standard for SQL. And we think that uh, this is going to result in, um, in uh, the same um, market Explo expansion as uh, it happened uh, with SQL in, in the late uh, 90s uh, or, or uh, early 2000s. We also have the document database community, so we have monthly, sometimes bi-weekly talks uh, related to uh, document databases just to get the ecosystem together to discuss how to do all of this without just one vendor, MongoDB, defining the course. Uh, so you're welcome to join. Uh, uh, we are available at documentdatabase.org. This is sponsored by FaradDB, created by FaradDB, but if you want to submit a talk which, uh, where you want to explain how FaradDB is the worst uh, idea you've ever heard, you're welcome to, to do so. So we are uh, impartial when it comes to uh, FaradDB. So make sure to check that out. And uh, we, don't have a, we don't have a time for a demo. However, we made it very easy for you to check out FaradDB. It's actually available on try.faradDB.io. This is powered by Sivo. So what happens at try.faradDB.io is you just click on a button and it spins up a Kubernetes cluster running on Sivo, and it makes FaradDB available to you for two hours. So you're going to get uh, user credentials and the Mongo URL, and then uh, you, you are able to, um, to uh, experiment with MongoDB tools or, or workloads on, on that uh, instance. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please check us out on uh, any of these uh, places listed here. Visit us on GitHub, where you can learn about our roadmap. We are developing FaradDB completely in the, in the open, so feature requests, or if you tested FaradDB and something did not work out, then you can uh, get in touch with us uh, on, uh, on, on these platforms. Any questions you may have? Yes? Uh, sorry, what was it? So, 
so you, you asked uh, that since we are building a layer on top of MongoDB, how much effort is it to catch up with MongoDB or the latest version? So we are not a layer on top of MongoDB. So you don't run MongoDB if you run FaradDB. We are a layer on uh, Postgres. So there is no catch up, catching up needed with uh, MongoDB. The only catching up we need to do is if MongoDB releases a feature which is very much requested by developers, then we need to uh, create that feature uh, for, for them to be uh, able to use on, on FaradDB. But the, the point of FaradDB is that you don't have to run MongoDB at all uh, in order to 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 get the uh, same uh, MongoDB experience as what you have with the real thing. Any other questions? All right, then thank you for your attention.